Yeah. Hey, y'all. Sorry I'm late. You are right on time. Oh, well, then yeah. sorry I'm right on time. <laughs> yeah, we, they were just accusing me of, of, of being early. Um, unpardonably early. Uh, unpardonably early. Unpardonably early, right. Yeah. I heard that. So There's only unpardonably early if you started eating the food. <laughs> <laughs> I that should be another max. Mm -hmm. I, or I'm already wordsmithing it. <laughs> <laughs> or giving the booze. Okay, so it is four o'clock. Uh, I'm your moderator, Ted Roberts. I'm a neuroscientist and blogger and writer. And this is First Contact Creating and Designing Aliens. I'm going to uh, ask each of our uh, panelists to introduce themselves and tell a little bit about how you come to be uh, uh, creating and designing aliens. And then we'll talk about some of your creations and then talk a little bit more about how the, uh, uh, what principles we're, we are applying, scientific, fictional, and the like. Uh, I would like to ask the, uh, the audience, if you have a question, please ask a question. Okay, don't start rambling off on commentary and the like so that we can keep this moving. If you have a question, please ask a question and we'd be happy to entertain those. Uh, but let these folks go ahead and fill in their... Uh, Karen, look uh, to your right. Sorry. That's okay. Get her badge. As my, friend, as my friend Mary used to say when she did uh, puppet shows for little children, a question is a phrase that begins with a word like how, when, why, where, or what. Just so you're clear, because... Uh, okay. So and why don't you start with these introductions? My name's Howard Taylor. I write and illustrate uh, a space opera called Schlock Mercenary. I've been running for uh, 12 years now, as of June 12th of 2012. Um, and uh, yeah, I put a lot of aliens in it. And my alien design centers around the ability to be able to emote and communicate punchlines, which means my aliens are a lot less alien than uh, the ones that I suspect were likely to actually find. But but that's a uh, that's a compromise that I've made for the fiction. Um, I love alien design. They're fun to draw. I have a great time with it. And. Uh, I have like zero scientific background, and so I'm going to blow a whole lot of smoke out of some nether orifices. <laughs> You're all right. Cool. Nether orifices. That, that was a whole nother universe. <laughs> I think there are lots of aliens and hangers on to that Welcome universe. There. Yeah. So anyway, I'm Travis Taylor. How are y'all? Good to see y'all again. And uh, I'm I'm you know a local Huntsville person. And I've written, I don't know, 14 or so science fiction novels slash and or books, including, to my knowledge, the only definitive textbook on how to defend the planet if we were invaded by aliens, uh, which also has been turned into a TV you know, movie for National Geographic Channel. Also, I have a TV show on National Geographic Channel you may have seen or may not have seen called Rocket City Rednecks. Huzzah! Uh, there you go. Uh, Big part. Congratulations on the Rio. Thank you very much. Yes, we are. We actually are filming at this con this weekend. So if you see cameras wandering around, you're likely to end up on TV uh, yeah, late fall. Fantastic. So uh, there you go. Uh, I've worked in you know space defense industry pretty much my whole life, and it's it's my my passion, this thing I like to do, and and because of that, writing science fiction, I put a lot of the space science into that, and uh, I really love. As you just said, creating new aliens and crazy things that we get to blow up and destroy in meaningful ways. <laughs> and and, uh, and that said, you know who I am, and uh, we'll we'll move on to the left to uh, one of my partners in crime and cohorts and and uh, uh, collaborators, uh, Stephanie. Hi, I think most of you already know me. Am I on? <coughs> Tap on it. Is that thing on? No. Nope. Let me put a new cord in. Go ahead. Here, Stephanie. Use that for now. All right, I think all of y'all already know me, but anyway, my name's Stephanie Osborne. Uh, yeah, I'm another one of the rocket scientists that run around Huntsville. Um, I worked in the uh, civilian and military space programs for over 20 years. And then I lost a friend on board Columbia. About the time that I gave him the first draft of my first novel, uh, which happened to have a scene that pretty much replicated what happened to Columbia, um, 
and uh, I got out of that sort of work and started writing full time. So, uh, yeah, he's, he's uh, my writing mentor, cohort, co-author, um, and, and I, I take care of, for those of you that are on Facebook, I'm the person that takes care of the official and unofficial Rocket City Rednecks fan page. Uh, yeah, thanks for doing that. <laughs> All right, so uh, again, I'd like to uh, I'd like to get back to the idea of some of the aliens that you have designed. Uh, I, I'm going to start this off with a comment that um, I, sitting immediately to my left is a man whose um, primary alien is a large blob of. He only looks like poo. <laughs> <laughs> It's actually a very complex set of uh, set of materials there, almost none of which are poop. <laughs> Have you ever read the book Mazeway? Anybody ever read that Mazeway? There's actually an it's like it's kind of like this uh, Hunger Games kind of book, but it's a sci-fi thing, and it's it's not because of they're made to do it. It's like you get great riches if you win. It's an unbelievably god awful obstacle course. And one of the main characters in there, pretty much, uh, is just like your character. It's just a blob of crap, but it can it, it can project tendrils and whatever else. And it's, it's, it's quite uh, quite exciting and interesting. Why? Never never seen anything like that in real life. Why am I reminded of, of uh, a line that Will Smith had in the second minute black movie? I don't know what's the line. <laughs> Man, you look like shit. No wait, you look like shit. <laughs> there you go. Well, when I designed uh, Sergeant Schlock, the, uh, uh, the, the operating principle at that point, you know, these were some of the, the very earliest things I did um, back in uh, early 2000. Um, I was doodling, you know, a little blob dude, and, and I drew a gun in his hand, and then I thought, well, where's he going to put it? And then he opened his mouth and, and put it inside. I say he opened. I drew him opening his mouth and, and putting the gun in. And I no, laughed I myself. What you mean, I laughed myself sick and realized that uh, not only was he going in the going in the strip, but he had to be central because I just I loved that piece of imagery. And it was a full year and a half later that uh, my brother and I were on our way down to Comic Con and he asked me uh, where'd Schlock get his eyes? Because all the rest of him is like blob, but he's got these two eyes. I said, well, yeah, he has to have eyes so I can emote with him, you know, so he can look at things. So he has a face. He has, he has to have a face or I can't tell jokes with him. And Randy said, well, uh, maybe, you know, maybe he got them from somebody else. And I realized, oh, oh goodness, no, stop right there. I, the, the story just told itself. He stole them. Um, and and that kicked off a whole process in which I had to go back and justify why an alien would look like a blob. You know, what, what makes him go? Uh, and the, the term carbosilicate amorph, uh, I'd been bandying it about as if it was, you know, just words that sounded clever, but then I started, you know, poking at the words and poking at the tech to see what would make him go. How can he be a blob who sometimes splatters and yet is sometimes strong enough to do something that requires a startling amount of tensile strength, you know, holding a firearm at arm's length or opening a door? Uh, how do these things work? Um, and the, I don't put most of those canoodlings into the comic, but the results of the canoodlings end, the, end up there all the time. And so, yeah, he looks like poop, but uh, He's faster than he looks, and I get a lot of mileage out of it. Forgive me, but I have to ask, are the eyes of match set? Nope. <laughs> well, they should be now. The, uh, you know, they should be, except they came uh, off the tree. that wouldn't be funny. And the first law of the Schlock Mercenary universe is that there always has to be a punchline, and if his eyes were both exactly <coughs> the same size, he wouldn't look as funny, and so we... Uh, uh, well, yeah, but but they grow on trees now, so. <laughs> what, eyes grow on trees. Yeah. His eyes His grow eyes on, grow on trees. trees. Cool. I, I just, I just, I just. I'm just sorry, I was, stop I was long winded. I could no. see him thinking. I could see oh, the Oh no, no, no. I'm no, gonna, no, I'm no, gonna, no, I'm gonna ask you to talk about your aliens, and we'll just keep on. Well, talk about my aliens. Gosh. Uh, well, let's see. 
my aliens have been everything from the little gray bastards that seem to abduct us and bother us all the time, and, and these UFOs that we see on TV all the time, to uh, uh, Zeus-like gods that, that have done really nasty, ugly things. They seem to always do really nasty, ugly things to us. These aliens are bad guys, apparently. <laughs> they need to all be killed. And, uh, yeah, well... And then, uh, then I have written uh, a story, of course, where an alien uh, crash landed in the backyard of this poor old uh, Vietnam vet's house, and uh, and he was real lonely because his wife had died. So, she, so this alien, of course, immediately transmorphed itself into a beautiful uh, uh, woman that was madly in love with the guy, and turned him into a superhuman young uh, uh, superhero type character. And then, uh, let's see, what else? It, I guess my uh, my favorite aliens uh, would have to be the, uh, the ones that that I put in the, the book that Stephanie and I wrote together, Extraction Point. And I, I, and I, I really hate to uh, explain what the aliens are because we don't actually tell you what the aliens are. Uh, in the book, you kind of have to figure it out for yourself. And it's, There's it's another one, book coming. It's one of those things where um, the aliens... Buy the book. There's one of those things where, the, where uh, what I like to do is, is make it where it, it could happen. And then you, you think, well, that's crazy. How in the hell could that ever happen? And, and, and it's a lot of fun with that. Like, let me give you an example. Anybody ever heard of the uh, Great Flu Epidemic in the early 1900s? You know, and, well, what was that? 1918. Yeah, 1918. Uh, Greg Matloff, and I don't know who Greg Matloff is, he wrote this book with the, uh, Eugene Matloff called the uh, uh, Starship Handbook or something like that. And uh, he's written a bunch of other books about space travel and things. Well, he and I were talking one day, and we, we had the idea that uh, the flu epidemic seemed to follow a pattern along the surface of the planet. And it looked like what would happen if you passed through the tail of a comet while the Earth is turning it would track along certain latitudes along, along the surface of the planet. And uh, then we got to really looking into it and, it, and it really kind of startled us because it looks just like where the flu outbreaks were was where we passed through, and we had just passed through how it's common uh, at that time. And uh, it's really interesting, and we're was finding it that- or was it Inky? Maybe it I think it was Maybe, I think you're right, I think it was Inky. Anyway, it was a common. And uh, we've recently discovered, you know, that, that biological, uh, organic material anyway, it could be frozen into uh, ice and live for years and eons, and it's possible that a comet could have captured a flu virus uh, from wherever, and uh, the flu virus is frozen in there, and it comes through and melts, and the debris hits the planet, that, that we're continually, you know, infecting ourselves that way. But what if that was by design? Because think about what the flu virus does to each and every one of us when we get it. It actually changes our DNA. So if you wanted to change a species DNA over a long period of time until you molded it just right, so then it would be a perfect vessel. You'd be a vector. Uh, then so a, a really easy way to do it would be to make you sick for a, eons until it evolves your species to be just what you want it to be, and then you come in and you've got the perfect host vessel. Viral recombinant DNA. Cool. So anyway, I thought that was kind of fun to play with, especially after you know it's kind of got some real basis that you know I want to go back and, and, and do some other. Uh, find some other epidemics and some find if they map to other comet uh, crossings or so on. That's really uh, an intriguing idea that alien life forms and microbial uh, status could be out there in the comets just floating around. Maybe on Mars, you know, maybe maybe there's wherever. Maybe it's that black crappy ooze stuff that turns your eyeball, makes you sew your eyelids shut that they had on the X-Files. Um, remember that they had to sew their eyelids and their noses shut? That was the craziest crap I ever seen. Right. Maybe maybe that's our next nonfiction book. Yeah, what's on our eyelids shut? No, <laughs> like a whole other, It's all the kids are doing it now, man. It's goth thing, you know. It's so it's right. It's the next thing to cut it, and now you sew it back up. <laughs> well, no, that way you could, that way you could get a good eyelid piercing. Yeah, there you go. Right. I'm not sure where to go after this. Uh, well, <laughs> to the bar. That sounds like a sweet pets. Um. Mm, a lot of the stuff he's written, I've either written with him or picked up on, like the, the Crest Bears, the, the alien that landed in the backyard. Um, I, I had to to, uh, to go on. 
He stepped out of that series and I stepped in. Yeah, only because it was, it was just contractual things, not because I didn't want to continue writing it. But I had. Jace was about to be born. Yeah, I, I had like, I was overwhelmed. We couldn't finish the series, but we had a great outline for three books, and, and I didn't want to see the book not keep going. And so I asked Steph to, to step in and finish the series for me, and, uh, and with our other full author. Uh, Daryl Bain, but anyway. So, 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 so I sort of took the Cresperians and kept developing them, and then we also developed another um, set of aliens who, who were not nearly as friendly. They're known as the Snappers, and they they are um, an interstellar empire. And so, in the course of of things, uh, as the the humans and the Cresperians try to find the Cresperians' home world. Uh, they, encamp they encroach upon the Snapper Empire, and this turns out to be a very bad thing. And by book three, and I'm, think there, I'm working on book four now, and depending on how much I get finished, I may tie it all together in book five, or I may get it all tied together in book four. Um, but in depends book on how well book four sells. There may be, yeah. <laughs> no, it just depends on, on how long it takes to tell the story that I want to tell. Um, but how altruistic. <laughs> um, anyway, book three, I basically refer to it as, as a, an interplanetary cage fight. <laughs> so, um, I've also got, uh, you know, you're, you're stere in burnout, I've got your stereotypical Grays and the lizards, you know, that, that are constantly being reported about in in, uh, in the UFO. UFO phenomena, <coughs> or at least references to same. Publishers and what's available now, as opposed to what you're working on. Oh, those two books that, or these two series that we're talking about were published by Twilight Times Books and uh, Pal Paladin Times or whatever. Well, the that's, a, that's an imprint of Twilight yeah. Times, yeah. Um, so, and you can get them. I mean, Amazon has them. You know, they're they're already. Available. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yes, they're yes, available. They're yes. all available. Yeah. And not just teasers. No. Extraction Point actually, it's a fast-paced uh, action thriller kind of uh, spy novel kind of thing. With but you don't realize that there's the things you're spying on turns out to be a little more super. The biggest yeah. thing I disliked about that book was it stopped. Yep. Well, that's because yeah. it's a All series. Right. Give us a chance. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> let's, let's confine the questions, please. Uh, and I'm going to ask a question because this sort of ties into where I want to go with this next, which is uh, viewing first encounters and where. But I, it could, could it not also be argued that both of you have written uh, a different form of alien, which is the alien out of time? In other words, it's one that looks just like us but doesn't come from our time frame as well. Uh, you've written that into Extraction Point and also into Displaced Detective. Yeah. You read the book. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, you didn't see the blog that he did? Man, he did a fantastic review of all the right. books. So, uh, so actually, you know, part of this uh, panel is talking about the aliens that y'all have designed, but also to, to discuss some designs and some first contact ideas, uh, I, I'd like to take this in a, in a direction in which you talk to us about you know how you would design an alien if we were designing an alien from scratch right now a new one not in not in one of your existing books cool. and then also talk about uh, how you see that first contact occurring when where if, do they come to us do we go to them um, do we find out they've been here all along man you know what we need we really need a touch pad right here so our illustrator can keep up with yes. us as we, as we do <laughs> right there on the screen man and, and, all right so and, you gotta look like this and that how luxury? science fictionish do you want to be about our current space program yeah right <laughs> well no, I'd, I'd start i i always start from uh from you know what's what's the story what's the story that i want to tell is there an interesting story that i want to tell um and if if I, if I want to talk about an alien, I want to talk about alien biology. You know, we could sit here all day and speculate about biology, but all we're doing is laying little individual pieces of story seed. It doesn't start being interesting to me until a couple of those things grow together and, and there's some synthesis happening and we've got, uh, you know, an alien who has to steal eyeballs in order to see. Uh, and, you know, a story grew out of that. Um, and so when I look at uh, when I look at alien biology, I start asking myself, 
uh, what are the things what are the things that we take for granted that would be just absolutely completely weird completely to overburden the word completely alien to us if uh, if the aliens did it differently I start by asking that question, and then I work backwards to the biology to figure out why on earth the aliens would be that dumb. When I talk to people about aliens and what I try to make a, get a point across, and I, and I do this actually from a scientific standpoint. I've done this uh, to folks in the intelligence community. I've done it to students in uh, my aerospace engineering courses. I've done it in a lot of different places, even in, in genres like this, is to explain to you how weird alien culture we have what, what alien means. It is an alien, right? It's, it's alien. It's not something we thought of. But it's because it's alien. I, I, I immediately say, I want you to go watch the Rocky Horror Picture Show. <laughs> <laughs> Laugh as you must. Laugh as you must. All right? But that's some weird-ass aliens right there. <laughs> okay? I mean, I mean, serious. I mean, why are they here? What are they? They're here to be transsexuals or transvestites or to just have fun and experiment and play with us like rats in a cage and then they've got their own internal power struggles going on and and they look human but are they human what are they, they seem to be strong they have super brains but they have no morality at least that we perceive as a morality and so it's completely alien the aliens in the rock horror picture show are completely alien it's a perfect description if you want to start with Find something that's so damn weird, it weirds you out. That's what an alien is. So if we were going to design such an alien, right? So we should we should decide, is it going to be a little alien that, you know, crawls in your skin and takes over your body? Is it going to be a big alien that comes down and starts stomping on buildings? Is it going to be an alien that shows up as a baby and grows here all our life living with the, some farmers out in Kansas? I mean, uh, we, we, let's pick an idea and then let's just build an alien right here in front of everybody. I'm in. Me too. I'm in. Okay. Um, so, <clears throat> why don't I, in, a, in a similar panel at RavenCon, uh, we had a discussion in which the panelists, scientists and science and science fiction writers, basically said the biology is going to be probably carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen. Okay. That's, mainly be mainly, mainly, for, okay, mainly for minimum energy for the for the molecular bonds. Okay. I could, I could see substituting silicon for carbon. And, and that was where the discussion went. Well, and silicon. I could see it also being von Neumann uh, probes. Right? Uh, you know? Okay. But, but I like, let's make, let's make it biological. Let's make it biological. Is that right? Okay. Yeah, let's make it biological. Organic, okay. organic so, chemistry. And, and so I'm the moderator. All I'm doing is okay. you guys start in on it. Right. So why don't we say that uh, it, it developed on an Earth-like environment. So we kind of, we understand the biology a little right. better. Okay. How much water on the planet? Well, so it's Earth-like. Earth-like, yeah. so some, some something in the Goldilocks zone somewhere that's uh, got a planet kind of like Earth. Could be a forest moon on Yavin. I don't give a damn. Uh, well, no, no, there's a reason why I'm asking that because the diversity of life on Earth is is far greater in the oceans than it is on land. Yeah, I was just I was just thinking the same thing. One of some of the most alien life forms. Uh, you can find on the planet are the like the mimic octopus or oh, that yes. crayfish that's you know a zillion different and colors and you look at it and think wow what are you are you talking with those i think I it's that thing that tried to eat nemo's dad that has the dangly little light thing out there <laughs> and, and, and <laughs> the bottom of the pit. Yeah. Um, but yeah, speculating so oh that's the alien that's right there it, it, it feeds on 14 year old boys and it's got a got a real hot chicken dangled from the thing <laughs> out of his mouth and, or maybe it's his tongue looks like, uh, uh, never mind. It, uh, this is a family show, isn't it? No? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're, but, we got that on tape. Oh, okay, all right. <laughs> but, but seriously, though, okay, so uh, something weird. Is it going to be a water, a water creature then? I, I, like the, I like the aquatic idea because that, that forces us to branch out. We're not going um, to get, a, we're not going to be able to pull the Star Trek thing and uh, slap something on somebody's forehead. Call is it a alien. swimmer or is it bipedal? Or multi or? Multilateral symmetry. Oh, uh, let's go asymmetric. I love Ooh, the asymmetric. I love asymmetric. the, I love the aesthetics of asymmetry. But what in line? What what in what biological creature that we know of, other than uh, microbes, are asymmetric? Stone crab. What? A flatfish. 
it's still, it's, it, it's still, still symmetrical. It's still, it's still, still symmetric. got it's got one axis of symmetry yeah. though. Like a flounder still has one axis of symmetry between its eyeballs. Seahorse is symmetric along one plane. Yeah. So what fish did you say? Stone crab. Stone crab. Is it not does it not have a radio axis or something of symmetry? It's big claw, little claw. Yeah, but that's it's a cheat. I know it's a cheat. But that, that's because so, of so it's flounder because it, because in fact it's not bilaterally symmetric once the eyes migrate. And so uh, if you put in something to the effect of uh, of an epigenetic transformation, you could get. Bumped. Okay. Well, I have, I have I have a, a thought then along those lines. There is this uh, worm, parasitic worm thing, that it crawls into the heads of crabs. And it's real little when it gets there. It crawls in through a crack in the shell and sets in its brain and it grows and continually grows to, and, it, and it controls this crab. Just like the damn, uh, the, the, so worm, the, the worms that start yeah, 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 yeah. okay. and it and But it continually controls the, uh, the crab until there's nothing left of the crab. And then it uh, eventually is eating the crab and goes on to its next one. And I forget what it's called, but it was in this, uh, I've read about it. Yeah, it's real. This is a real thing. Shit. <laughs> and uh, and it, it, it's a sea, it's a little sea creature that does this, and, and, and it'll make tendrils grow down into the, the crab arms and all that, and control it. So is that a, is that actually a symbiotic creature, or is that a parasitic creature? Uh, you know, I wouldn't it? I wouldn't think the crab thinks it's a symbiotic, <laughs> <laughs> but it may tell it, it may make it think it. Thinks it. For a while, the crab's like, yeah, this is pretty cool. I don't have to do any work. <laughs> I would I would I would definitely call it parasitic. <laughs> Oh, but that's uh, the, um, uh, the the model you're you're leaning towards. There is also very alien to us. The idea that uh, you don't have a sapient life form until you have a merger between these two things that have somehow evolved together. Uh, Niven was it Niven and Purnell did that in the uh, 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 Legacy of Hero, the the sequel to that. Those critters. Uh, were mostly just monsters, but every so often one of them would get sick with a virus up its nose and, and the brain got bigger. Uh, yeah, the idea that, uh, that these creatures, whatever they are, um, they're not sapient unless there's some sort of merger with something else. And the something else isn't sapient without, without the merger. So we've got a life form that's... Uh, now, now that, there's a cool reproductive cycle for yeah. us yeah. right there. You're, you're talking about <laughs> four sections. Basically, in, yeah. in every genetic transform yeah. is, is what you're talking and, about. And, and so they can't actually be, they're not sentient until, like, the, the puppy and the, and the cat eat each other. <laughs> and Dogs and cats and, and, living together. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> then, the jingle dog and the calico cat. Yeah, so, right. And then, and, then, and then at that point, for some reason, there's enough brain matter there that, that connects and interacts and they create a, a sapient life form. The law of Griffin. Yeah. So we uh, now have Nobody a, liked that. Okay. So we'll just erase that for a It could be Sorry. that all right, we'll say if we're gonna be in the ocean, why why not have it be just some random parasitic creature that eats some other kind of creature and then when they eat each other the, that's or when he takes over, then their brain melts together, and it, it becomes a senior. Okay, so we got so we have an ocean dwelling, uh, two ocean dwelling, two ocean dwelling. That basically we have a fusion of two life forms that gives us the sapient form. All right. Composite entity. Composite. Yes. Okay. Uh, and we we I mean we've playing with the idea of crab because I wrongly said that stone crabs are asymmetrical. <laughs> Um, so do, do we want something like exoskeletal like and something I, I like that. Yes, yes yeah. I like that. And, okay. and what's real cool about that is the sentient creature doesn't have a reproductive cycle. The reproductive cycle is the crabs and the worm things. Oh, man, and that is why they're so brilliantly intelligent. They never spend <laughs> any <laughs> time thinking <laughs> about sex. <laughs> there you go, right there. And see, in in my in in my world in the world of writing the schlock mercenary comic once i'm able to tell that joke the rest of the story is done i i yeah, got i yep yeah, yep yeah, that's my that's my selling point i know that this is worth uh, this is worth making okay so what is the largest shell creature in the ocean <sighs> yeah I, I know there's some lobsters that get up to well, about 30 I'm, 40 pounds but, uh, mobile or, or giant clam yeah giant, giant clam. clam it just lays there yeah, that's, that's, that's part it of its reproductive cycle. It just lays there. Why? Well, I mean, come, come on! Nobody's going to say nothing about that. Clams got legs. 
What? Clams got legs. But the worm could make tendrils come out of it to make it move around. Like that. Maybe yeah. it's like a giant scallop. Maybe it can squirt around, and swim around like a scallop. Well, if, if if we have if if we have a slightly lower density planet. Then the gravity would be less, so a giant crab's gravity, 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 gravity is you, you don't need to mess with gravity if they're underwater because they're buoyant. Yeah, so yeah but the the structure of the materials is, is, is important. And, and also the pressure. Yeah. Yeah, because see, the weight of the water has to do with the thickness of the uh -huh. shells and all that. So if there's slightly less gravity, then the pressure can be less so that they can grow bigger and not have to have as dense and, and crazy okay. shells, right? Okay, if you're going to talk about a, a, an exoskeletal creature, then. You, it, it needs to be horseshoe crabs. Okay. Okay. How big I, got, get? I got to I see mean, those last year. The first time they cool. get huge and they look evil. <coughs> yes, they, they do. Have, <laughs> and they have cyanide blood. Okay. So you cyanide blood. Really? So like you they find do. one of these things on the beach, you are like, oh shit, go in the other direction. Well, then, then, then what we need is the uh, the worm thing to have something like hexane in its blood. So when it, when they form together, you get a hexacyphernate or something. Some, and that, so. That way, you know, if you eat them, or maybe they instantly die once they become sentient. Like, <laughs> they, they, they become sentient for like a split second and they die from cyanide poison instantly. And they're the smartest creature in the universe. I or, guess, or I the story if you had the they explode, right? Yeah. Every, every last one of them is all, I think, therefore, oh shit. Yeah. <laughs> it's, like, it's like the ultimate scene. They, they know the ultimate answer. They actually know the question to the ultimate answer in the universe. But, but, but they die immediately as soon as they get it, right? Wow. Well, now we've got a plot. We need to be able to talk to one of these before he dies. Yes, so, 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 so where, how is the and, and, first contact? And, 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 you got to create some. We, we, oh. we, we, in, in that split second that it becomes sentient, it becomes super sentient. It becomes almost yeah. omniscient. Yeah, and it's yeah, like, yeah. It's so like suddenly, 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 you know, the whole meaning of the universe is like, oh, I've got it! Yeah, I got it. It's it knows the stars. ultimate question, yeah, the ultimate yeah. answer. And, and so uh, that, that would be awesome. So how do we, how, now here's the trick. How, when, and where. Now so we've got to get it. there and keep one of them alive right. long enough, all right, right, to get the answer and get the question. We have we have hands going up like okay. Yeah. Questions. Oh well. Yes. <coughs> Comments. Questions. Oh, questions. Questions are awesome. We love questions. Well, why don't you just change their metabolism rate? They, it can be a split second for them. It might be a couple of months for an hour time scale. I was just thinking a uh, relativistic uh, process of some sort so that we could do that. We put them in a in a near uh, light speed spacecraft. <laughs> and, and we've got them flying around in this aquarium, you know, that's going around near the speed of light. And then we have to, so time is dilated for and them. And they're trying not to bark. Well, time's dilated for, well, yeah, time's dilated for them, but from their perspective, it's still they only still a only have a second right. to think about. So that doesn't really help us much. No, that's not. It just prolongs the agony. You found a very, very expensive way for us to, uh, us to fill up their gap. We could toss them over into a black hole so they would die forever. Okay, okay, Tom. He took okay. care of the next thing. Maybe when they get this big burst of omniscience, they can communicate with others of their kind, so their race is sequential. One is always achieving and, they, and passing to the next one. And they have a, a genetic memory, right? So it passes from one, one offspring to the next, well, if you want to call it offspring, then I guess they're outsprings or they're ups, or upsprings or something. Well, okay. They're just uh, instantaneously. All right. Sorry. Oh, no, some of this, uh, hang on, some of this intelligence, let me, let, me, uh, let, me, let me play with this. I think we've got, I think we've got some. Yeah. Um, it's not very interesting if they just have a thought and then pass. Right, right. right. If they have the ability to think, and craft something, something pheromonal, something aquatic, you know, smart ink, whatever, so that the thoughts that they've had are not lost. Oh, That's not part of the reproductive cycle. It's part of the reproductive cycle. <laughs> it, it trigger, they, they do something, they emit something that triggers the crabs to want to keep uh, reproducing and the worms to want to keep eating the crabs and, and all the, that. The, right? But the next one, you know, the, the next generation in line, the next ones that come to, uh, came to in this solution and so they're, they don't all think, you know, I think they're four, oh shit. They all think, well, you know, two plus two is four, and four plus four is eight. The next one in line, uh, you know, they're having... So the intelligence, so, so the it's knowledge... It's a serial intelligence. Yeah, it's not a, it's not a hive mind, it's a well, serial The mind. only way to do that, no, the only way to do that then is that their brains are clearly quantum computers. Okay, and, and so what happens, well, which our brains are, our brains are quantum computers. So what happens is, once the sentence is formed, there's a quantum wave function created for that 
that uh, entity, okay? And then when it dies, quantum wave functions don't die, right? They're still there. So when the next, next vessel forms that that quantum wave function can adhere to, it coheres immediately to it. So the quantum wave function of its entity is still floating around in the universe, uh, which happens to be at the bottom of this ocean, right, wherever it is. And, and when this thing forms, okay, it, it coheres to it, then it dies, but then another one is born and then it coheres to it. Time doesn't mean anything in quantum physics, uh, as we can, we can okay. determine. Well, so. we had a couple more questions, uh, and I'll come back to you, Tom. I was thinking about the hive mind thing, serial mind thing, and then you got answered, so okay. they have to have a sign up somewhere saying, do not interrupt the serial mind. <laughs> well, I like the smart ink ideas, by the way. Tom, the what, what I did but what happens smart ink. when the world starts to die? Yeah, I was, I was actually, Tom, that's a fantastic question. I was going to say, you know, one of our crises may be that below a certain threshold, there aren't enough of these serially picking up the thought. I mean, because, you know, thought is branching. I, we've described it as being serial, but it's it's branching. We have to go down. You have to make a whole lot of mistakes before you get something right. Um, super intelligence is kind of boring. I like I like the try fail cycle. Um, but if population numbers start to drop, uh, suddenly they have a real problem because they recognize, oh no, there aren't enough of us to think about all the things we want to think about uh, because the little octopus versions aren't having enough sex and the <laughs> the crabs are getting something toxic from these humans that landed up on the shore. You know, as they get smarter and smarter, and I, I actually like the idea of the ink, so maybe... No, maybe it came from that end of the table. Oh, where so. was the, no, it, 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 it came from... I, from so it was the smart ink. Well, uh, but, you know, like they're, they're kind of squids or whatever, and, yeah. and they, they yeah. squirt it out in the water, and then it hits... But, but what I was thinking is, as, as they got smarter and smarter over their years of evolution, um, okay, they, their thought process is much faster when they become senior. And so, although to us, they, they only live, you know, a few a second or something before they spontaneously die from cyanide poison, they, they may have had like a supercomputer's worth of time to solve the problem. Yeah, that's what I was just thinking. And uh, especially yeah, I think because I think they, they themselves, by the rate of their processing capability, ha generate their own kind of... There, there's a scene. I, I get, there's a scene in, the, in, 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 in Star Trek: First Contact, right? Right. Where, where uh, uh, Picard asked Data, you know, if he had really considered uh, be, becoming a Borg, and, and he said uh, only for like point something or other microseconds. But to an android, sir, that is an eternity. Right. You know, I, so I, I, I suspect there is a relevant question here. So well, I was just going to comment that everybody is spreading out. The waves are going out, and suddenly there's that. Arctic cold front that comes through <laughs> and the smart ink got disrupted and now you have the thoughts got factions. a little in Maybe different you got directions. Factions. Oh my gosh, you've got old old okay. smart ink. So we, we you know we talk about the try fail cycle, okay? And you know you make lots of mistakes. But over here on the fringes you've got some of this old smart ink from a train of thought that was just really awful. Oh the hippie <laughs> the hippie <hippie's laughs> <crap. laughs> but, but, but it got but it, it got froze. It got frozen up. Now we're, uh, you know, oh, a thousand, the a thousand the years later, a thousand years later, or an ice age later, 10,000 years later, this thaws out and we have thought pollution. <laughs> As this old thing sweeps in and a bad idea <laughs> sweeps into our new culture and starts uh, There's a lot of that. Yeah, it. yeah. It's kind of like, you know, communism or something. <laughs> <laughs> it, uh, you know, our, our you know, Facebook. the, the beatnik movie. <laughs> So, so how are we going to have contact? Oh, well, I was thinking there's all sorts of, there's a great turmoil, inner struggle going on between them. Well, we've got okay, maybe, maybe, there's, maybe there's a group of them that were, you know, the hippies uh, that were in SETI back in the 70s, and they sent a signal out somehow to the universe that said, hey, we're here. Okay, we are wonderful crab-eating aliens. <laughs> I love the hell out of some snow crabs. <laughs> All right, and maybe we figured out a way well, that if you slice them, if you slice them just that's right. If you slice them just right, you can get the cyanide out of them like a blowfish, right? And then there's one good spot that's really yummy. So there's a group of the aliens who are pissed off at the other little crab worm things because they told the universe that hey, we're here, y'all come eat us. And the others are saying we should be hiding because aliens might come eat us. So there's there's a xenophobic group and a bunch of hippies. 
that they, the, the Saganites, as I'd call them, that believe the aliens are going to come and send rescue you and give you the cure for cancer. So, I yeah. think our, our human protagonist, our human protagonist, is an astronaut, uh, you know, space traveler, you know, bubblegum space, shrimp. But he, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> his, his father, his father was a world-class fugu chef. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Italian, but it's, 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 it's good. And, it's Ooh, me. and it has an awesome set of knives. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that was, he spent his weight limit so bringing far. knives. This has to happen off planet. That's a good point. It could be. Yeah, these, these, the, these creatures could be at the bottom of the ocean near the lava tubes, and that could be why their chemistry is so different yeah. than, than ours. And, and there are that's a good point. This this could be an alien encounter right here on our own planet. First contact now being served at Joe's Oh yes, that's, that's, that's perfect right there. That's the title of the book. When all your servers, when I edit the video, that will be the title. <laughs> when all your servers get up and they're all dancing together, yeah, that's the smart ink pollution. Right? <laughs> And there's a side effect, man. Humans probably get really intoxicated off of smart ink. Yeah. It's probably Which worse means... than LSD and caffeine and, and PGA all together. Which, which means that you, that you have to have you have to have your your fugu chef. So so your whole meal consists of the special little delicacy part of these sentient whatevers, and your drink is. The smarty. Yeah. So that so so you right. Have so the little boats deal. that they do, you know, and it's got yeah, like the, the, the crazy little little boat full of smarty. Oh, yeah. And instead of instead of oh, it was a very good year. It's oh, it was a very good idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What's because that? because. Because the smart ink works on humans too. I thought you were going to say because of the wonderful things he does. I didn't know. Is anyone there? No. Not in public. No, because because the smart ink works on humans too. Sure, but and, it, but and it's not. not but and it's not intoxicating. Just to make them it's not intoxicated, just, uh, but it also gives them the same idea. So so you got now. So now we've created we we created a new beating movement here on in the human culture of all the all the. So-called intellectuals going and eating this. Let me let me pull this. Thing. Let me let me pull. I'm having a great time. Let me pull this back though and ask, because you got to ask this question: Why would the smart ink? I mean, if we postulate these things evolved in our own oceans and that they're down there somewhere having massive uh, branching serial groupthink. Um, whoa! Uh, whoa! <laughs> uh, why would the smart ink work on us? What's the mechanism? Could there be a mechanism? Well, that's real. That's actually that's actually not too too far of a grasp to go because most things that cause you to be intoxicated are really they're they're toxic. Yeah. And so if Love these toxins. Yeah. yeah. So if these things are highly toxic, uh, it, it's under certain cyanide certain mixtures, molarity uh, levels of it or whatever is probably okay to take some amount. So it does something synaptic to you. you yeah. Yes. Most Drink of your it. toxins are mutated neurotransmitters. Bizarre. Yeah. What he said. <laughs> no, no, it, it's, it's, you just you just tweak part of the one of the uh, one of the branches on a neurotransmitter, and lo and behold, you've got um. a toxin. But because it still has the neurotransmitter uh, key on it, it will lock into the appropriate places in the neural system. Maybe it's an MAOI inhibitor, so you can't take it with uh, with Viagra or whatever the other ones can't take. You know, all the, don't do not take this is, drug. Maybe it, it is Viagra. Don't, don't eat cheese. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe it is Viagra. <laughs> but so now, in terms of in terms of telling in terms of telling an interesting story, uh, so we got our we got our Fugu, Fugu chef. Looks like he doesn't need to be an astronaut. At all. He's James Cameron's Fugu chef. James Cameron's Fugu chef. <laughs> and while he's searching for the Titanic in his no, in his no, no, no. gajillion no, dollar no. submarine he's when built. He's going down in a Marianas trench. Oh yeah, he's gonna do that again yeah. too, yes. So James Cameron's Fugu chef. James can they haul some of these up stuck to the bottom of his, his explorer that he's doing for National Geographic, right? So how do you Let keep me plug them from blowing up? National Geographic. What? How do you keep them from blowing up? We just cut out the cyanide. You just cut out the Fugu chef's cutting out the cyanide. Right, but how do you keep? What well, my question is? Okay, they ride up the 
on the bottom of the vessel. Oh, they're going to decompress people... slowly. You have to bring them up and decompress them no. slowly. You put them in a net and you slowly bring them up. It takes four hours to bring them up or however okay. long. They can control the nitrogen in their blood. Yeah, yeah. But that might, oh, the different chemicals in decompression may, changes the toxicity oh, of yeah, the things. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Such that uh, this one was brought up on nitrogen, it will give you a hell of a buzz, but you have a bad hangover tomorrow. <laughs> right? Yeah. And this one we brought up too quickly, it's about to turn. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, so here's the, but here's here's a, a story I do for you. You know, you start serving these up, and, and the first folks who uh, have the, the, uh, that's, why, that's why we have Avatar, you see, is James Cameron was eating one of these things, and, and it was a bad, it had already turned. <laughs> so they have, the, the, the folks who are eating these suddenly start having... Uh, in 3D, thoughts. in 3D. Thoughts in 3D. <laughs> in 3D. Digital 3D. Real digital. There you go. You, but you think, it's, you think it's just a bad ink trip. But what you're actually having is what you're actually having is somebody else's thoughts, and you can build a whole story around decoding the dreams of all the people who had lunch together. <laughs> the dream was of Joe's crab shack. See what it was? One of these crabs saw this really big blue fish. <laughs> it was chasing and about to eat it, and it was having nightmares right before it emitted its last little bit of. Smart ink, and that's the one that Cameron ate, and that's why we have Avatar. <laughs> <laughs> Those crazy big blue things are always well, in the way. Nice uh, we, have a, we, have a, we have a question over here. Change a little bit of the topic since you brought that up. In your opinion, on the panel, worst and best alien visualizations in the movies? Uh, for, me, for me, for me, by the far the worst is the Star Trek foreheads. It's just, I mean, I realize it's a budget, but forehead or buy. I yeah, I, I, I didn't. I didn't buy it, and I know that uh, you know you, you, they retcon that stuff into the Star Trek universe. And they justify it and all that, but the fact of the matter is, all of the aliens were just like us, uh, only monocultural versions, and I never found that very interesting. So. Mm. I'm sorry. Are, there are other worst. I'm, I'm <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm just. I'm, I'm thinking. Well, the, the worst aliens in my mind, uh, visually, was E.T. I mean, E.T. couldn't even walk around. He could barely move around. That was, again, budgets. Yeah, that special yeah. effects were horrible. The best alien is Yoda. Because Yoda will kick your ass. <laughs> He's 900 years old and walks on a cane, but he will still kick and, your ass. Right? And, for, and for what it's worth, okay, mentor, protege, Yoda, Padawan. <laughs> So uh, yeah, I, I liked uh, I liked H.R. Geiger's uh, alien design. That design where it looks like it's you know part crustacean and part bad plumbing um, was the the movie Alien worked on us so effectively because for the first time we were looking at something walking around and behaving in the way a monster or a wild animal might, but it looked. Alien. Yeah. It convinced us that it was otherworldly and completely different. Honestly, uh, really, the best written alien is is from aliens. I mean, yeah. the, it's yeah. got a full life cycle. That's got a very complicated life cycle. Uh, it's got acid for blood, which is you know, cool in its own right. Uh, but the, but the cool thing is, it takes it takes a, a symbiote. It takes uh, you know uh, eggs. It takes a, a, a queen bee. It takes the whole you know big complicated or organic. Yeah. Process and and that's probably one of the better aliens that yeah. that, that I've seen. Now, Highland's uh, puppet masters are, are really awesome too. I mean, what what worst what? worst alien for me would probably be the uh, plasma farting beetles. Plasma <laughs> 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 farting beetles. Oh no, uh, Mar Mission to Mars or what? Yeah, Starship. Oh, Starship. Oh, 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 the movie. The movie. Oh, Let's make it. Yeah. 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 To go to qualify that. That, 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 that had nothing to do with Robert Heinlein's Starship Trooper. Yeah, well, that's kind of my point. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of farting, uh, Lawrence Schoen's Buffaletos. Uh, I'm not sure exactly where they, where they fit on the best worst scale, but it's a thing that looks like a bison that's about this big that can eat anything and farts oxygen. Fantastically useful. They turn out to have been, you know, a designed creature. But uh, his buffaletos, cute, 
clever little construct that's uh, uh, silly and wonderful. Sounds like the Which, ass blasters in uh, yeah. Tremors 27 or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they, they kept up with the Tremors franchise? There were three of them, four of them. And then a TV four. show. There's even a TV yeah. series, right? Yeah, a TV yeah. series. Yeah. Okay, so we 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 hit our 10 minute limit, uh, 10 minutes to the top of the hour. So let's have some final thoughts on, I, I mean, best worst aliens or where would you go closing now with remarks. closing remarks? Where would you go with our design? Oh, I would have them conquer the humans. <laughs> uh, they figure out that all they have to do is get us all addicted to the smart ink, and then they can control our thoughts by giving us the smart, the right smart ink thoughts. And then it's a, a, a domination turned on its ear. And maybe this was a plan maybe. by a smart one all along oh, oh, oh. to convince, to, to get captured and have all this and, the, and, and And what happens is that, that you wind up with the worm thing, now then in start in, in humans. Okay, we've, I've, I've got it, and it's the, it's the hidden, history, uh, hidden history story trope, okay? Y'all know about the uh, Great Mooney Sushi Conspiracy, right? Actual, I'm being silly about it, but it's an actual piece of fact. Sun Young Moon of the Moonies thought, I need an economic empire. I would like to introduce the Americans to sushi. And today, about 70% of the sushi that you eat was caught, transported, and sold to you by franchises that are owned all or in part by Sun Young Moon. Now, some people say, well, I don't want to be funding the Moonies by eating sushi, so, so screw it. And I think, no, the more they become like capitalists, the more they're like me. Now, here comes the secret history part. What if Sun Young Moon's idea came to him because he got himself some yeah. ink, and down there on the bottom of the ocean, there's this group of crab, squid, hybrid, what's-its, who are serially thinking and figuring out how to migrate their whole intelligence onto the human race by first addicting us to sushi and then introducing the cyber whatever smart fuku ink. smart ink smart stuff. Ink. Yeah. Because, because they know they're, they, they they're, they're going to die anyway. Plan. Yeah. So they made a biology that, that that's not going to only live for a, a, a second. Right. And so this was all a big plan all along. And we thought we were the conquering. They predator. need somebody who knows how to build spaceships that can carry aquariums. Yeah. <laughs> well, they found out. They heard somebody talking anyway. about there being an ocean on on Jupiter that's sixty miles deep. Right. An of uh, 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 Europa, one of the moons of Jupiter. So they're like, man, we got to go out in space. Just no right. contract with right. the uh, <laughs> Panelists, thank you. This has been wilder than I ever met. <laughs>